Chapter 2 of The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. About halfway between West Egg and New York, the motor road hastily joins the railroad that runs beside it for a quarter of a mile, so as to shrink away from a certain desolate area of land. So here we have um, our map where we've got East Egg, West Egg, and it says between West Egg and New York. So here's Manhattan. Um, and actually the area that we're talking about is right in here. Um, so, uh, so notice that it is not between the two eggs. It's on the way, like you would go from either egg and then on your way to, to New York, you'd go through there. Um, so it's a desolate area of land is what we need to know. This is a valley of ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat into ridges and hills and grotesque gardens, where ashes take the forms of houses and chimneys and rising smoke and finally with a transcendent effort of men who move dimly and already crumbling through the powdery air. So here notice the natural and unnatural images that are kind of put together. And we've got a lot of alliteration also so fantastic farm, grotesque gardens, um, but uh, they, it's as if ashes um, have some personification here, as, as if they're growing. So we might think about the, um, about the contrast between what should be growing and what actually is. Um, it's almost unstoppable, this growth of ash, this industrialization that's going on here. Um, where they're becoming the houses and chimneys, and then they're actually becoming humans, these ashes, and these poor men who are dimly and already crumbling through that powdery air. So we get all of this obscurity, um, this, this inability to kind of see through this, this grayness, this ashiness, as we start here through the valley of ashes. Occasionally, a line of gray cars crawls along an invisible track, gives out a ghastly creak, and comes to rest. And immediately, the ash-gray men swarm up with leaden spades to stir up an impenetrable cloud, which screens their obscure operations from your sight. Notice how many references to sight um, and obscurity we have here, um, of being able to see and not being able to see. And, the, and the, the color gray, leaden and spades both also uh, tend to be that gray. Uh, but above the gray land and the spasms of bleak dust which drift endlessly over it, you perceive after a moment the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. Um, so this is going to be important here. The eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg are blue and gigantic. Their retinas are one yard high. They look out of no face, but instead from a pair of enormous, gigant enormous yellow spectacles, which pass over a non-existent nose. So we are thinking about how exactly he's describing this. We've got three foot high retinas. Um, there's no face, but spectacles, no nose. Um, so we're trying to capture that and figure out what exactly is going on. Evidently, some wild wag of an oculist, that's an eye doctor or a glasses salesperson, set them there to fatten his practice in the borough of Queens and then sank down himself into eternal blindness or forgot them and moved away. But his eyes, dimmed a little by many paintless uh, days under the sun and rain, brewed on over the solemn dumping ground. And so we do notice that the eyes are looking over the Valley of Ashes. So that's the key, is that they seem to just be hovering over and seeing everything here, um, even though everything is potentially obscured. Um, but we've got to figure out what concretely these are. Um, they are these kind of floating huge eyes that are set there to fatten his practice um, and that they should have been painted potentially. So we're recognizing now that this is a billboard, an advertisement. Um, so recognizing maybe even a connection with uh, consumerism, with sales, etc. The Valley of Ashes is bound on one side by a small foul river, and when the drawbridge is up to let barges through, the passengers on waiting trains can stare at the dismal scene for as long as a half an hour. So notice that they have vision, potentially. There's always a halt there of at least a minute, and it was because of this that I first met Tom Buchanan's mistress. So we go from the description into action now, uh, the actual things that are happening. 
the fact that he had one was insisted upon wherever he was known. And we know that actually um, from last time is that Jordan knew, Daisy seems to know, everybody seems to know except for Nick didn't know. Um, but everybody does know. His, acquaintance, his, his acquaintances resented the fact that he turned up in popular restaurants with her and, leaving her at the table, sauntered about, chatting with whomsoever he knew. So he is not even trying to keep this a secret. He brings her to popular places where all of his friends are and then gets up and talks to his friends. So definitely open secret. Though I was curious to see her, I had no desire to meet her. So this is very Nick. Um, wants it, like he wants to kind of know about her, but the idea of actively meeting her is uncomfortable. But I did. I went up to New York with Tom on the train one afternoon, and when we stopped by the ash heaps, he jumped to his feet and, taking hold of my elbow, literally forced me from the car. So here's Nick getting uh, shoved around again by Tom. We're getting off, he insisted. I want you to meet my girl. I think he'd tanked up a good deal at luncheon. That means that he's drunk. And his determination to have my company bordered on violence. This is no surprise from Tom Buchanan, this idea of violence. The supercilious assumption was that on a Sunday afternoon, I had nothing better to do. And what we notice there also is that Tom might be assuming this fact that uh, Nick has nothing to do on a Sunday afternoon, but we're not really sure if Nick does have something better to do. He certainly doesn't argue that he did have something planned. So maybe, maybe Tom is right, but he doesn't, Nick doesn't like him assuming. I followed him over a low whitewashed railroad fence and we walked back a hundred yards along the road under T TJ, under Dr. Eckelberg's persistent stare. So again, we are being made aware that Eckelberg is seeing everything that they're doing right now. Um, that in theory, seeing a mistress should be illicit, should not be seen, um, but Tom doesn't make it a secret and Eckelberg, these eyes are looking over it and seeing all. The only building in sight was a small block of yellow brick standing on the edge of the wasteland. Um, so we've got this idea of yellow brick. It doesn't sound particularly nice, even though we might equate it with the yellow brick road. That's not, not what Fitzgerald would be referring to. Um, a sort of compact main street ministering to it and contiguous to absolutely nothing. So there's, there's an idea that it could be a main street and or interesting, um, but it's not actually, uh, it, it doesn't actually live up to that. One of the three shops it contained was for rent. Another was, uh, was an all-night restaurant approached by a trail of ashes. There's those ashes again. The third was a garage, repairs, George B. Wilson, cars bought and sold. And I followed Tom inside. So this place, this George Wilson's garage, is their destination. Um, so it's the third destination. The interior was unprosperous and bare. Um, that's a fun word because we don't usually do the opposite of prosperous. We would usually say poor or something like that. Um, but here we've just got that prefix that gives us an odd usage of that word. The only car visible was, was the dust-covered wreck of a Ford, which was crouched in a dim corner. So this idea of, of, uh, um, of those crumbling men, um, the crouching car that's dust-covered, and if this is a place where cars are bought and sold, um, it doesn't seem to, it is unprosperous, it doesn't seem to be actively um, being bought or sold, right? There's not actually active commerce going on. It had occurred to me that this shadow of a garage must be a blind that the, and that a sumptuous and romantic apartments were concealed overhead when the proprietor himself appeared in the, uh, in the door of an office. So this idea of a blind, of a facade, but then we notice the use of that specific word instead of facade um, it, when we've had all of these words having to do with sight um, that it makes it even more significant. Um, so, to, so Wilson um, appears in the door of the office, wiping his hands on a piece of waste. He was a blonde, spiritless man, anemic and faintly handsome. So notice kind of the washed outness. He himself is ashy. Blonde is a lack of color in the hair. He doesn't have spirit. He doesn't have energy or blood. Um, he might be handsome, but it's faint, um, as, if it, as if you could see it if it were closer or sharper in some way. When he saw us, a damp gleam of hope sprang into his light blue eyes. So again, we've, we've also got his light blue eyes, which is again washed out. 
even this gleam of hope is dampened, so not quite as able to see it or get the, the uh, details out of it as one would want to. Hello, Wilson, old man, said Tom, slapping him jovially on the shoulder. How's business? I can't complain, answered Wilson, Wilson unconvincingly. Um, so really, we know that he could complain. When are you going to sell me that car? Next week. I've got my man working on it now. Works pretty slow, don't he? No, he doesn't, said Tom coldly. And if you feel that way about it, maybe I, I'll, uh, I'd better sell it to someone else, somewhere else after all. I don't mean that, explained Wilson quickly. I just meant, so notice here the power differential, um, that Tom has something that's ostensibly why he's there is to sell this car to the owner of the garage. Um, but Wilson wants what he has and therefore Tom has all of the power. His voice faded off, so again, that idea of fading, and Tom glanced impatiently around the garage. Then I heard footsteps on the stairs, and in a moment, a thickish figure of a woman blocked out the light from the office door. So we've got that she has substance, um, where everything else, the men crumbling and, and, uh, and George Wilson, seem to kind of lack substance and you can't quite see them or touch them. She is there blocking out the light, not kind of seeing through. She was in the middle 30s and faintly stout, but she carried her surplus flesh sensuously as some women can. So here, instead of being like slovenly or, um, or somehow unattractive because of her extra flesh, it makes her sensuous. It makes her curvy and kind of, um, and kind of uh, sexual in some way. Um, hence, maybe the, the idea of a mistress. Her face, above a spotted dress of dark blue crepe de chine, contained no facet or gleam of beauty. I'm going to note her outfit here, um, that we haven't really gotten descriptions of anybody's clothes until this moment. Um, and so that might tell us that her clothes are particularly important to her or should be to us. Um, so she doesn't have any beauty, but... There was an immediate perceptible vitality about her, and vitality means alive. Um, so there, where everything else in this valley um, seems to be covered by ash, not really alive, all uh, industrial, she is alive. Uh, something of uh, vitality about her as if the nerves of her body were continually smoldering. This might have something to do with ash also, but maybe the burning that comes before ash. She smiled slowly and walking through her husband as if he were a ghost, shook hands with Tom, looking him flush in the eye. So again, we get this idea that, Tom, that George Wilson doesn't really exist. Then she wet her lips and without turning around, spoke to her husband in a soft, coarse voice. Get some chairs, why don't you? So somebody can sit down. So she's taking charge. Um, she's kind of ordering him about. Oh, sure, agreed Wilson hurriedly, and went toward the little office, mingling immediately with the cement color of the walls. So here again, he is gray. He blends into the cement. A white ashen dust veiled his dark suit and his pale hair as it veiled everything in the vicinity, except his wife, who moved close to Tom. So she is the exception to this dimming effect that this place has. I want to see you, said Tom intently. Get on the next train. All right. I'll meet you by the newsstand on the lower level. She nodded and moved away from him just as George Wilson emerged with two chairs from his office door. We waited for her down the road and out of sight. It was a few days before the 4th of July and a gray, scrawny Italian child was setting torpedoes in a row along the railroad track. We might get the idea of, um, of a little bit of, uh, we've noted his ethnicity, and so here we might be dealing with some ideas about immigration that he may not be too uh, integrated into American society. He is notably Italian here. Um, that, uh, that as we're tracking maybe some of those things we might take note of. Terrible place, isn't it, said Tom, exchanging a frown with Dr. Eckelberg. So again, we've got Eckelberg noting what's going on here, seeing these interactions and seeing what's going on. Awful. It does, her, does, uh, it does her good to get away. Doesn't her husband object? It seems like it would, like this idea of an affair. Um, seems like a husband would object to if they knew. Wilson, 
He thinks she goes to see her sister in New York. He's so dumb he doesn't know he's alive. So again, this idea of being alive and this kind of maybe in the Valley of Ashes just needing to subsist that life doesn't happen um, at that particular place. So Tom Buchanan and his girl and I went up together to New York, or not quite together, for Mrs. Wilson sat discreetly in another car. So this is different, right? Discreetly. Tom deferred that much to the sensibility, sensibilities of those East Eggers who might be on the train. So while he tends to flaunt his uh, mistress, this idea of the people from East Egg who are fashionable, um, he might be at least, I mean, as I say, deferring um, to them. And so we wonder if those other people uh, that he shows her off in front of um, would be from East Egg, that he seems to be maintaining some sort of respectability in some places. She had changed her dress to a brown figured muslin. So this is her second outfit. Um, she, would, she didn't want to go into the city with this particular outfit on, which stressed, stretched tight over her rather wide hips as Tom helped her to the platform in New York. At a newsstand, she bought a, a copy of, of Town Tattle and a moving picture magazine, and in the station drugstore, some cold cream and a small flask of perfume. So what do these things have, have in common? Like, she wants to see things, the, uh, the gossip magazines, and then she also maybe wants to be seen, cold cream and perfume, to make herself more alluring. <coughs> Excuse me. Upstairs, in the solemn, echoing drive... <coughs> Excuse me. She let four taxi cabs drive away before she selected a new one, lavender colored with gray upholstery. So she is choosing a cab based on how it looks. Um, so we're very, very focused on um, all through here on how things look and getting the things that seem nice. And in this, we slid out from the mass of the station into the glowing sunshine. But immediately, she turned sharply from the window and leaning forward, tapped on the front glass. Notice that we do have glowing sunshine. This is a contrast to the Valley of Ashes where everything's dim and obscured. I want to ha get one of those dogs, she said earnestly. I want to get one for the apartment. They're nice to have a dog. So notice these words. That she wants to get a dog and they're nice to have. This is about... Um, acquisition, not about um, any desperately wonderful thing about a dog. We backed up to a gray old man. So we noticed that he also is gray. So maybe he's somehow in some way related to what's going on in the Valley of Ashes, who bore an absurd resemblance to John D. Rockefeller. So here in contrast to that Valley of Ashes, we've got Rockefeller who represents money and success, etc. In a basket swung from his neck, uh, cowered a dozen very recent puppies of an indeterminate breed. So this idea of breeding um, and who else here might be of an indeterminate breed, we know that, uh, that, um, that Nick has a pedigree. Uh, we've been told what it is. Uh, but maybe Myrtle Wilson is of an indeterminate breed? Um, and we might be even thinking back to that, uh, to that Italian kid in the Valley of Ashes. What kind are they? Asked Mrs. Wilson eagerly as he came to the taxi window. All kinds. What kind do you want, lady? This idea of being able to choose your pedigree um, clearly is, uh, um, is false, but maybe says something about um, being able to reinvent self or, uh, or something like that. I'd like to get one of those police dogs. Do you, I don't suppose you got that kind. The man peered doubtfully into the basket, plunged his hand in and drew, up, drew one up, wriggling by the back of the neck. That's no police dog, said Tom. No, it's not exactly a police dog, said the man with disappointment in his voice, worried he's going to lose that sale, maybe. It's more of an Airedale. He passed his hand over the brown wash rag of a back. Look at that coat, some coat. That's a dog that'll never bother you with catching cold. I think it's cute, said Mrs. Wilson enthusiastically. How much is it? So the idea of attractiveness and then straight to cost. That dog? He looked at it admiringly. That dog will cost you $10. The Airedale. Undoubtedly, there was an Airedale concerned in it somewhere, though its feet were start startlingly white. Changed hands and settled down into Mrs. Wilson's lap, where she fondled the weatherproof, co weatherproof coat with rapture. 
Is it a boy or a girl? She asked delicately. That boy, that boy's a do that dog's a boy. It's a bitch, said Tom decisively. So this idea of the salesperson not even bothering to, to do a, a superficial check to, uh, of, uh, of sex um, and obviously being wrong, um, kind of this maybe putting on an act, this idea of sales, etc. Here's your money. Go and buy 10 more dogs with it. So he's recognizing this as a mercenary type thing. Um, and Tom is not worried about this money um, and kind of recognizing that it is a quick turnover type thing for this, uh, for this salesperson. We drove over to Fifth Avenue, which is known as a very posh part of New York, so warm and soft, almost pastoral, on the, summer after, on the summer Sunday afternoon that I wouldn't have been surprised to see a great flock of white sheep turn the corner. So contrast with the industry of the Valley of Ashes versus the pastoral, even though we are in the city now, that maybe the city requires that other stuff to happen so that it can be actually um, white and clean um, and pastoral and, and lush and soft. Hold on, I said, I, ha I have to leave you here. No, you don't, interposed Tom quickly. So again, Tom making decisions for Nick. Myrtle will be hurt if you don't come up to the apartment, won't you, Myrtle? Come on, she urged. I'll telephone my sister, Catherine. She's said to be very beautiful by people who ought to know. Um, so this idea of, um, of other people determining beauty or worth, well, I'd like to, but we went on, cutting back back again over the park and toward the West Hundreds. So Nick has not gotten his way. He is going regardless. At 158th Street, the cab stopped at one slice in a long white cake of apartment houses. So here, the idea of a white cake again, um, there, was the white, there was the wedding cake of a ceiling at Tom and Daisy's, and now there's a, a slice of a white cake of apartment houses. Um, something kind of drawing them together, but this does not sound nearly as sumptuous. Throwing a regal homecoming glance around the neighborhood. Mrs. Wilson gathered up her dog and her other purchases and went haughtily in. Um, so the idea that for Mrs. Wilson, it's homecoming, um, that this is her space, not, uh, and so it is where Tom and she have their little uh, get togethers, but it really is her space. Um, notice that the dog is connected to a purchase um, and that she is haughty, that she's uh, kind of above everything and she is kind of the owner of this house. Um, even though she technically probably isn't. I'm going to have the McKees come up, she announced as we rose in the elevator. And of course, I've got to call it my sister too. The apartment was on the top floor. A small living room, a small dining room, a small bedroom, and a bath. So notice the reinforcement through anaphora of how small this place is. Um, we might consider the airiness of the uh, of the Buchanan's house and the hugeness of Gatsby's house compared to how small everything is here. The living room was crowded to the doors with a set of tapestried furniture entirely too large for it. So here, getting things that don't fit, there's something that isn't harmonious about all of this. So that to move about was to stumble continually over scenes of ladies swinging in the Garden of Versailles. And so we've got this, again, a contrast of wealth and fashionability on the tapestries that contrasts with what's going on in this apartment. The only picture was an over-enlarged photograph, apparently a hen sitting on a blurred rock. Looked at from a distance, however, the hen resolved itself into a bonnet, and the countenance of a stout old lady beamed into the, down into the room. So here, that's one of those common, like, you can perspective pieces where you can look at it in two different ways. Um, a little bit kitschy, certainly not fashionable, probably. Several old copies of the town tattle lay on the table together with a copy of Simon called Peter and some of the small scandal magazines of Broadway. So this tells us a little bit, bit about Myrtle Wilson probably in that she tends to collect those gossip type magazines um, and, uh, and things like that that are lying around this apartment. 
Mrs. Mrs. Wilson was first concerned with the dog. A reluctant elevator boy went for a box full of straw and some milk, to which he added his, on his own initiative a tin of large, hard dog biscuits, one of which decomposed apathetically in a saucer of milk all afternoon. So again, we get this idea of smushiness um, and kind of messiness, so things that aren't really working in a beautiful way. Meanwhile, Tom brought out a bottle of whiskey from a locked bureau door. So we've got the idea of alcohol again. He was already potentially drunk when he got there, um, and now we're adding more alcohol to the mix. I have been drunk just twice in my life, and the second time was that afternoon. So we get Nick as a um, th this idea of not being drunk, maybe some innocence, um, and certainly maybe choice, but here it just seems to be the, the seedy and seedy time for this to happen, maybe, I guess. So everything that happened has a dim, hazy cast over it, although until after 8 o'clock, the apartment was full of cheerful sun. So this idea of dim, hazy cast, which kind of reminds me of the Valley of Ashes and the dimness there, um, that even with a cheerful sun, it still feels hard to see and kind of hard to get through. Sitting on Tom's lap, Mrs. Wilson called up several people on the telephone. Then there were no cigarettes, and I went out to buy some at a drugstore on the corner. When I came back, they had disappeared, so I sat down discreetly in the living room and read a chapter of Simon, Simon Called Peter. Either it was terrible stuff or the whiskey dist distorted things, because it didn't make any sense to me. Simon Called Peter, um, the title, I've looked up the book, I don't remember, um, but the title refers to um, the apostle. Uh, Peter, that uh, whose name was Simon until Jesus renamed him. Um, but here he is sitting, uh, everybody's disappeared. He's again an outsider going to do an errand and then people disappear. Um, so Tom and Wilson, uh, just as Tom and Myrtle reappeared, so they were in the bedroom that whole time. Um, so they're not overly concerned with being hospitable to Nick. Um, so Tom and Myrtle, after the first drink, Mrs. Wilson and I called each other by our first names, reappeared, company commenced to arrive at the apartment door. The sister, Catherine, was a slender, worldly girl of about 30, with a solid, sticky bob of red hair and a complexion powdered milky white. Her eyebrows had been plucked and then drawn on again at a more rakish angle, but the efforts of nature toward restoration uh, was toward the restoration of the old alignment. So this idea of trying to... Uh, trying to change nature with her eyebrows and draw them on in a more fashionable or more attractive way, but that the nature keeps coming back over. Uh, when she moved about, there was an incessant clicking as the innumerable pottery bracelets jingled up and down upon her arms. She came in, came in with such a proprietary haste, as if she owns the place, and looked around so possessively at the furniture that I wondered if she lived here. But when I asked her, she laughed immoderately, repeated my question out loud, and told me she lived with a girl, girlfriend at a hotel. So this might, you know, have something uh, that kind of, that maybe she has a stake in Tom and Myrtle's relationship that she likes, uh, would like to maybe have all of this for herself, but certainly um, ownership through her sister. Mr. McKee was a pale feminine man from the flat below. He had just shaved, for there was a white spot of lather on his cheekbone, a little imperfection that's a little bit uh, maybe endearing for him. And he was the most respectful in his greeting to everyone in the, in the room. He informed me that he was in the artistic game, and I gathered later that he was a photographer that had made, some dim, made the dim enlargement of Mrs. Wilson's mother, which hovered like an ectoplasm on the wall. Notice that it's a dim enlargement of Mrs. Wilson's mother, um, and so this must be that hen that turns into a, a person. Um, but ectoplasm, also another word maybe for ghost, uh, that uh, that's hovering there. Remember that Wilson, George Wilson, was also referred to in a ghost-like way. His wife was shrill, languid, handsome, and horrible. Notice, like some of these things really contradict. Shrill and languid don't seem to get go together. Um, and this idea of being both handsome, which is like, oh, I'd like to know somebody like that, but horrible. She told me with pride that her husband had photographed her 127 times since they'd been married. 
Mrs. Wilson had changed her costume some time before and was now attired in an elaborate afternoon dress of cream-colored chiffon. So this is outfit number three. And notice that we're now calling it a costume, i.e. that she's playing a role, um, that she is choosing this and putting on the clothes that, uh, that put her into wherever she is uh, that she wants to go. Uh, which gave out a continual rustle as she swept about the room. With the influence of the dress, her personality had also undergone a change. So there again, we get this idea of a role. The intense vitality that had been so remarkable in the garage was converted into an impressive hauteur. So life, again, is the key that's, uh, that, is, that is her nature. Um, but then she is putting on the role of being haughty, of being above it all. Her laughter, her gestures, her assertions became more violently affected moment by moment. Um, so we've got this idea of dimness and violence that just kind of goes through this chapter. And as she expanded, the room grew smaller around her. Remember that room, small, small, small. Until she seemed to be revolving on a noisy, creaking pivot through the smoky air. Smoky air like that valley. My dear, she told her sister in a high mincing shout, most of these fellas will cheat you every time. All they think of is money. I had a woman up here last year, last week to look at my feet, and when she gave me the bill, you thought she, she had my appendicitis out. So notice that her language is kind of low class. Um, she doesn't necessarily speak the right words. It would be my appendix out. Um, there's a little bit, you know, fellas is, is more colloquial than, um, than maybe genteel. Um, and this idea of all they think of is money, when all we've seen from her is materialism. So we've got a little bit of irony there. What was the name of the woman? Asked Mrs. McKee. Mrs. Eberhardt. She goes around looking at people's feet in their own homes. I like your dress, remarked Mrs. McKee. I think it's adorable. Mrs. Wilson rejected the compliment by raising her eyebrows in disdain, um, which is beautiful because, again, it's that role she clearly wants those compliments if this is her third time changing, but, uh, but rather she's putting on that role of haughtiness. It's just a crazy old thing, she said. I slip it on sometimes when I don't care what I look like, which we know is false. But it looks wonderful on you, if you know what I mean, pursued Mrs. McKee. If Chester could only get you in that, in that pose, I think he could make something of it. That's Mr. McKee, the photographer. Um, so this idea of memorializing or of turning, of, of, maybe, of maybe stopping that time and kind of taking it in some ways, making it tangible, not sure. We all looked in silence at Mrs. Wilson, who removed a strand of, her ha of hair from over her eyes and looked back at us with a brilliant smile. Mr. McKee regarded her intently with his head on one side and then moved his hand back and forth slowly in front of his face. So this artistic kind of uh, look, trying to look, look at the, um, the scene. I should change the light, he said after a moment. I'd like to bring out the, mo uh, the modeling of the features and I'd like to try to get, uh, get hold of all the back hair. So this idea of depersonalizing, it's no longer a human, but the features, the modeling, the hair. I wouldn't think of changing the light, cried Mrs. McKee. I think it's... Her husband said, shh. And we all looked at the subject again. So again, uh, now Myrtle is a subject rather than a person. Whereupon Tom, you, B Tom Buchanan yawned audibly and got to his feet. You and McKees have something to drink, he said. Get some more ice and mineral water, Myrtle, before everybody goes to sleep. I told that boy about the ice. Myrtle raised her eyebrows in despair at the shiftlessness of the lower orders. Um, again, irony, because she theoretically um, is not much above anybody else, except when she's here with Tom. These people, you have to keep after them all the time. She looked at me and laughed pointlessly. Then she flounced over to the dog, kissed it with ec ecstasy, and swept into the kitchen, implying that a dozen chefs awaited her orders there. So her role is that of a very wealthy person who does kind of orchestrate all of these, uh, all of these people, the lower orders. I've done some nice things out on Long Island, asserted Mr. McKee. Tom looked at him blankly. Two of them we have framed downstairs. To what? demanded Tom. Two studies. One of them I call Montauk Point, the gulls, and the other I call Montauk Point, the sea. The sister Catherine sat down beside me on the couch. Do you live on Long Island too? She inquired. I live at West Egg. Really? I was down there at a party about a month ago at a man named Gatsby's. Do you know him? 
I live next door to him. So again, this idea of if you know Long Island, if you know West Egg, then it's Gatsby that is the name that exists. Well, they say he's a nephew or a cousin to Kaiser Wilhelms. That's where all of his money comes from. So we've got this idea of rumor that we might not know where uh, Gatsby's money comes from or where he comes from. Really? She nodded. I'm scared of him. I'd hate to get ha have him get anything on me. Um, so this idea of mysteriousness um, and, uh, and, and that he's some sort of danger because of that mysteriousness. This absorbing information about my neighbor was interrupted by Mrs. McKee's pointing suddenly at Catherine. Chester, I think you should do something with her, she broke out. But Mr. McKee only nodded in a bored way and turned his attention to Tom. I'd like to do more work on Long Island if I could get the entry. All I ask is that they should give me a start. Ask Myrtle, said Tom, breaking into a short shout of laughter as Mrs. Wil as Mrs. Wilson entered with a tray. So this is funny. Um, because he wants to get into Long Island, i.e. the fancy Long Island. And the Wilsons technically live on Long Island, but not the good parts. So, uh, so really, what he would want is an introduction to the people who have money on Long Island, which would be Tom. She'll give you a letter of introduction, won't you, Myrtle? Do what? She asked, startled. You'll give Mickey a letter of introduction to your husband so he can do some studies of him. So there might be really kind of poking some fun um, at, uh, at the lack of success and connections that, um, that his mistress, hu mistress's husband has. His lips moved silently for a moment as he invented George B. Wilson at the gasoline pump or something like that. Catherine leaned close to me and whispered in my ear, neither of them can stand the person they're married to. Can't they? Can't stand them. She looked at Myrtle and then Tom. What I say is, why going on living with them if they can't stand them? If I was them, I'd get a divorce and get married to each other right away. So here, we are getting this outsider's uh, vision of this. Like, of course, oh, they look so happy together. Um, we've seen Tom and Daisy together and know that, uh, that certainly there are some problems there, um, but that also that they uh, belong maybe to that same secret society. Doesn't she like Wilson either? The answer to this was unexpected. It came from Myrtle, who had overheard the question, and it was violent and obscene. So very, very emotional response. Of course, she doesn't love him. But again, this idea, like this is, I think, the third time this word has been used in this chapter. You see, cried, uh, cried Catherine triumphantly. She lowered her voice again. It's really, that his wife, it's really his wife that's keeping them apart. She's a Catholic, and they don't believe in divorce. Daisy was not a Catholic, and I was a little shocked at the elaborateness of the lie. So here, this idea that this is why, this is what Tom has said is the reason that he can't leave Daisy and get married to Myrtle, um, instead of just saying, well, I wouldn't want to marry you. But if you look at Daisy versus Myrtle and Tom being as wealthy as he is, um, the idea of who would he be married to, that maybe Myrtle is okay on the side, um, but would not be somebody to bring into society um, versus Daisy, who makes other people feel uncivilized. And that really is um, the role of a Tom wife maybe. When they do get married, continued Catherine, they're going to going west to live for a while until they until it blows over. So this there might be a little delusion there that Catherine does think that this will happen at some point. Um, and the idea of going west and remember in the last chapter, um, Tom said he'd be a fool to live anywhere other than in the east. So the idea that Tom would actually plan to move back to the west seems a little far fetched. It'd be more discreet to go to Europe. Oh, do you like Europe? She exclaimed surprisingly. I just got back from Monte Carlo. Really? Just last year, I went there with another girl. Stay long? No, we just, just went to Monte Carlo and back. We went by way of Marseille. Uh, we had over $1,200 when we started, but we got gypped out of it all in two days in the private rooms. We had an awful time getting back, I, tell, I can tell you. God, how I hated that town. So this idea of gambling, that's what one does in Monte Carlo. Um, and, uh, and that they lost a lot of money. $1,200 in those days is not, in, uh, in cons uh, is, is not uh, just throwaway money for somebody like Catherine. Whereas a lot of the people who would be playing in the private rooms, so she's chosen to play in those private rooms, but people who play in those private rooms probably could lose that kind of money and not have a problem. 
The late afternoon sky bloomed in the window for a moment, like the blue honey of the Mediterranean. Some really nice imagery there. Um, and the, since we were just talking about Europe, the Mediterranean makes sense. But this kind of this stickiness or softness also comes through. Then the shrill voice of Mrs. McKee called me back into the room. I almost made a mistake too, she declared vigorously. I almost married a little kike who'd been after me for years. Um, and so here we have a casual drop of a very nasty racial slur um, for a Jewish person. And so um, clearly she does not have a problem throwing this out and nobody's calling her on it. And so, like, again, we're, we're considering ethnicity, we're considering insider, outsider, maybe like this idea that he was below me, does that have to do with his uh, ethnic background or is it something else? Um, it seems to be thrown in there purposefully, though, in some way, shape or form. Everybody kept saying to me, Lucille, that man's way below you. But if I hadn't met Chester, he'd have got me for sure. So this idea of marrying, of needing to marry maybe, and kind of getting the best that you can at that moment. Yes, but listen, said Myrtle Wilson, nodding her head up and down. At least you didn't marry him. I know I didn't. Well, I married him, said Myrtle ambiguously. And that's the difference between your case and mine. Why did you, Myrtle, demanded Catherine. Nobody forced you to, Myrtle considered. I married him because I thought he was a gentleman. So this idea of that's who she expects for herself, she said finally. I thought, I, I thought he knew something about breeding, but he wasn't fit, fit to lick my shoe. So this idea, again, pedigrees. We had the dog with no breeding. We've got people from various backgrounds here. Um, and then finding out that he's not fit to lick her shoe. So we do wonder what her breeding is. Um, she certainly feels like and acts in her space like she should be able to, um, to orchestrate all of these uh, servants and stuff, but that is not where she is, and, she, and it does come off as an act, not as a natural thing. You were crazy about him for a while, said Catherine. Crazy about him, cried Myrtle, Myrtle incredulously. Who said I was crazy about him? I never was any more crazy about him than I was about that man there. Uh, she's pointed suddenly at me, and everyone looked at me accusingly. So here, uh, Nick again is being compared to a nobody. Um, and he's significant in that he isn't uh, important. I tried to show by my expression that I had played no part in her past. The only crazy I was was when I married him. I knew right away I had made a mistake. He borrowed somebody's best suit to get married in and never even told me about it. So this idea of deception uh, and also that maybe he was playing a role uh, in order to get her, this idea of clothes creating somebody's identity or person. And the man came after it one day, out, one day when he was out. She looked around to see who was listening. Oh, is that your suit, Ed? This is the first I heard about it, but I gave it to him, and then I lay down and I cried to beat the band all afternoon. She really ought to get away from him, resumed Catherine to me. They've been living over that garage for 11 years, and Tom's the first sweetie she ever had. The bottle of whiskey, the second one, was now in constant demand by all present. So everybody is getting, we know that Nick said that he's getting drunk here, but everybody is getting drunk, um, except in Catherine, who felt just as good on nothing at all. Tom rang for the janitor and sent him for some celebrated sandwiches, which were a complete supper in themselves. So nothing fancy with many course meals that's, you know, that's slowly kind of finding its way civilized from one end to the next, but rather a meal that's, uh, that's something to satisfy instead. I wanted to get out and walk eastward through, toward the park through the soft twilight, but each time I tried to go, I became entangled in some wild strident argument. Uh, which pulled me back as if with ropes into my chair. So this idea of being entangled and kind of pulled and tied down, uh, Nick doesn't seem to be all that good at getting out of things that people want him to do, but, uh, but he certainly seems wrapped up here. Yet high over the city, our line of yellow windows must have contributed, to, contributed their share of human secrecy to the casual watcher in the darkening streets. And I was him too, looking up and wondering. So this idea of windows, um, that, that you can only see a glimpse of things and what might be in there or what might be out of them, that people are wondering what's going on in their windows. Um, and it's so very interesting little idea here. 
I was within and without. Love that idea of, of being simultaneously in those two places, simultaneously enchanted and repelled by the exhaustible variety of life. So here we are seeing difference. We're seeing the Valley of Ashes. We're seeing this apartment in the city, which is very, very different from maybe his time in the West or different from the stuff on the eggs, etc. Myrtle pulled her chair close to mine and suddenly her warm breath poured over me, me the story of her first meeting with Tom. It was, on the, it was on the two little seats facing each other that are always the last ones left on the train. I was going up to New York to see my sister and spend the night. She had on a, he had on a dress suit and patent leather shoes. So this idea that maybe he represents the real thing that she was looking at with, uh, with her husband's borrowed suit. And I couldn't keep my eyes off of him. But every time he looked at me, I had to pretend to be looking at the advertisement over his head. So here this might make us think about um, the eyes of Eckelberg there, another advertisement from this chapter. When we came into the station, he was next to me and his white shirt front pressed against my arm. And so I told him I, I'd have to call a policeman, but I knew he, but he knew I lied. So this is flirtation, right? Um, I was so excited that when I got into a taxi with him, I didn't hardly know I was uh, getting into a subway train. So notice all of those kind of negatives there that uh, show her lower class way of speaking. All I kept thinking about over and over was, you can't live forever, you can't live forever. She turned to Mrs. McKee and the room rang full of her artificial laughter. My dear, she cried, I'm going to give you this dress as soon as I'm through with it. I've got to get another one tomorrow. So this disposability um, and disposable. Um, this idea that if she were just married to her husband who had to borrow a suit, she wouldn't have access to these things, certainly not be able to just like give one away. I'm going to make all of the list of things I've got to get. A massage and a, wa and a wave and a collar for the dog and one of those cute little ashtrays where you touch a spring and a wreath with a black silk bow for mother's grave that'll last all summer. I've got to write a list so that I won't forget all of the things I've got to do. So again, this idea of lists of um, all of this is money, spending, spending, spending. It was nine o'clock. Almost immediately afterward, I looked at my watch and found it was 10. So this is that drunkenness, right? Mm -hmm. Mr. McKee was asleep on the chair with his fists clenched in his lap, like a photograph of a man of action. So here the photographer becomes the subject, becomes the photograph. Taking my handkerchief, uh, taking out my handkerchief, I wiped from his cheek the remains of the spot of dried lather that had worried me all afternoon. Remember that was in this first introduction was that he had a little bit of uh, um, shaving cream on his cheek. The little dog was sitting on, on the table looking with blind eyes through the smoke and from, from time to time groaning faintly. So this again reminds us of that Valley of Ashes um, and the dog is not happy to be there. This is a baby, a puppy innocence and is being forgotten and put in this position that is not particularly healthy. People disappeared, reappeared and made plans to go somewhere and then lost each other, searched for each other, found each other a few feet away. Sometime toward midnight, Tom Buchanan and Mrs. Wilson stood face to face, discussing in impassioned voices whether Mrs. Wilson had any right to mention Daisy's name. Daisy, 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 shouted Mrs. Wilson. I'll say it whenever I want to. Daisy, Daisy, making a short, deft movement, Tom Buchanan broke her nose with his open hand. And so here we get deliberate violence. Um, this is not like when he hurt Daisy's finger. This is absolute deliberate and meant to send a message about her asserting that she can do what she want and Tom saying, no, you can't. And so you, you ask, why is it that Tom is so incensed with, uh, with him, with her saying Daisy's name uh, and, and what that might bring up for him? Then there were bloody towels on the bathroom floor and women's voices scolding and high over the confusion, a long broken wail of pain. Mr. McKee awoke from his doze and started in a toward the door. When he, got, when he had gone halfway, he turned around and stared at the scene. Notice it's a scene, um, going back to those roles. His wife and Catherine scolding and consoling as they stumbled here and there among the crowded furniture with articles of aid, and the despairing figure on the couch, bleeding fluently and trying to spread a copy of Town Tattle over the tapestry scenes of Versailles. So even in this moment, trying to save the fancy things. Then Mr. McKee turned and continued on out the door. 
Taking my hat from the chandelier, I followed. So notice that they are walking away from this chaos. Come to lunch someday, he suggested as we groaned down in the elevator. Where? Anywhere. Keep your hands off the lever, snapped the elevator boy. I beg your pardon, said Mr. McKee with dignity. I didn't know I was touching it. All right, I agreed I'd be glad to. And then we get these dot, dot, dots indicating kind of lost time, right? Um, I was standing beside his bed as he was sitting up between the sheets, clad in his underwear with a great portfolio in his hands. Beauty and the Beast, Loneliness, Old Grocery Horse, Brook and Bridge. Um, so looking at pictures, it seems. Then I was lying half asleep in the cold lower level of the Pennsylvania station, staring at the morning tribune and waiting for the four o'clock train.